Okay, hi, this is Donna Dracunis and our um, group for the Lithuanian Folk Tales Knitting Club. And our, our topic this month in our booklet and story was about the Baltic Sea and mermaids and amber. So the, the story that you found in your booklet was Yurate and mm -hmm. Kestitas and the tragic love story about how amber was formed. Um, so I thought I would show you some of my amber that I've collected over the years and give you some information about uh, different kinds of amber. So if you want me to be large on your screen, you can click on my video and click pin and it'll make me the biggest video. I might be anyway, depending how your Zoom settings are. But um, if you want to see closer up what I'm showing you, just click on my video and you'll see where it says pin and then I'll, I'll zoom out to the biggest video. So the word um, for amber in Lithuanian is gintaras and um, it's a man's name. So it's kind of different than us in English language where amber would be a women's name. Um, mm -hmm. And I have no idea anything about the origin of the word. But this piece that I'm wearing here is what natural raw amber looks like. It's, mm -hmm. not, it's not polished, it's not finished in any way. It can be like different colors and layers of colors and it just looks like a dirty rock a lot of times. Mm -hmm. But it's the style that's popular with jewelry right now, the unfinished amber. I bought this piece from a weaver that I met on a couple of trips and she weaves, I think it's really lovely because nobody wears the sashes that they used to wear anymore because they used to wear them as belts and ties and to hold up their socks and, and everything. And so she weaves some of these traditional patterns in colors to match the stones that she puts in the necklace. And of course I had to get one that was amber because I, mm -hmm. I love amber. <laughs> um, so that's, that's what it looks like unpolished and raw. And you all got a little little necklace or string of beads, however you want to use it, um, in your package. This is what some of they were all there's a bunch of different ones, but these are also this this these two particular ones are also unpolished raw amber in different colors. So you can see in this it goes almost to white and almost to black in yeah. the colors. And in fact, they call some of it in the stores white amber and black amber. You can buy no, no necklaces of those whole colors. I don't have any of either of those yet, so I'll keep I'll keep collecting. <laughs> but, so this is these are unpolished raw stones, and they make these necklaces. Um, I really like them because they sell them all over the place in in uh, stores for tourists. I don't know if local people wear them because they're sold mostly for tourists, and. Um, they're in all the tourist markets, and I have some that I had bought for myself there. These are like uh, more of the colors of the gold, and this this one's kind of called a cherry or what's that cherry brandy called? Um, oh. Yeah, so th there's names like that, and then you have, of course, the, this is what we often think of as the amber color. And then again, all the way to the really dark brown and almost black. So these are um, something that they invented, I don't know when, but it's made out of chips that are left over for when, when they carve, if they carve bigger amber stones into different shapes. So rather than um, having all this waste, they make these lovely, pieces out of them and I just really I wear I wear these all the time I got this one on my very first trip to Lithuania and um, I still wear it all the time um, this is another kind of beaded necklace that you can find a lot of places and it's just got even little small tiny pieces that are put on now these are polished but you can still see all the colors white to black to the reddish mm -hmm. cognac. That's what I was thinking of. Mm -hmm. Cognac, mm -hmm. cherry color. <clears throat> and some of them you might can maybe can see here are, are kind of like solid and some are mm -hmm. transparent. Mm -hmm. So I, the way I understand it is 
transparent amber is not really natural. Amber has air bubbles in it because um, if you don't know, it is not a stone. It's actually petrified sap, tree sap. So this tree sap mm -hmm. came out of these trees millions of years ago and petrified and hardened into almost like a stone. And it's been mm -hmm. underwater and underground and all different places. This is a kind of transparent piece. And from what I understand is to make it come like this, they heat it in oil and oil fills up the air bubbles in it and it becomes kind of transparent. Hmm. So Kathy's got a piece like that too. I just love this. Um, and this is the kind that you see where you can see bugs in it. So, um, because if it's completely opaque like this, if, if there was a bug in it, you would not be able to see it, right? Unless it was sticking out. But with this, you can see, you can see what's inside it. And I just, I love, it still has a few things in it. I don't know what they are, imperfections or, uh, pieces of tree bark or debris from when it was formed. And I just think that makes it really interesting looking. So th that's my other piece I got on my very first trip to Lithuania. That's what I do every time I go to Lithuania, I buy myself uh, something of amber. And I don't usually, I mean, they have crazy, you know, really fancy, giant, expensive stuff. I try to buy stuff that I'm really going to actually wear and enjoy, not just bring home and put on a shelf because it's so... Uh, valuable or too fancy. And these days, like I'm super dressed up you guys because I'm still <laughs> in COVID mode and I just wear t-shirts and stretchy sweatpants okay. or shorts <laughs> still all the time. Um, I haven't been out much yet and uh, really looking forward to next year because um, we're, we're planning now to reopen and have some retreats here in Vermont again next year. Um, this year was too, like, it's too questionable and not sure what was going on. So we didn't plan anything, um, for this year. So I'm looking forward to next year, like see some more people face to face. Oh. You don't mind. I want to show off some things dearly beloved got yes, from me please. when he found out I liked Amber. Okay. Who is <laughs> speaking here? I am Grace. Grace. Okay. Just so we can zoom in on you. And we can pin you and and see large what you're going to show us. So this is a one of the translucent Ooh. ones with all the stuff inside. I don't see you. Here, here, here. Everybody <laughs> else, do you see Grace? Yeah. 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 Okay. So I'm not going to worry about it. Um, oh, now you're up. Okay. It must be just something with my internet connection or something. Oh, let's see now. I love Amber. So oh, that's beautiful. I got oh, wow. at a street vendor in Chicago. Okay. Ah. Uh, was going with Dearly Beloved. He, his job had him going to Chicago like twice a month. And wow. Went with one time and we were driving to the hotel and I'm like, there's tents all along here. And it's like, I know where I'm going tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> and then this one is just chock-a-block. Oh, beautiful. Oh, my. With bubbles Great. in and they covered the is that back. silver on the back? Oh. That must make it shine, the, the bubbles no, shine more. It, it feels more like they, they just dulled the back. Okay. So that it would be like a mirror. No, it doesn't reflect. It's just no. a mat. Okay. Interesting. And then the big one, um, we had been walking past the jewelry store on the corner in town for literally a year and a half. And so he went in and made them an offer. They did not refuse. Oh, my God. Oh, wow. See, that's just amazing. Now... I would never have anywhere to wear something like that, but <laughs> it's just gorgeous. It actually looks really, really great just on a turtleneck. So awesome. during the winter, awesome. oh, wow. that wow. is just beautiful. Beautiful. 
Yeah, maybe, maybe when our auditorium that was connected with the university, but during COVID, the university said, oh, we're not giving you any more money. You're now totally on your own. Starts opening back up. Yeah, we'll get out our capes and our hats and I'll wear this. Yes, that's <laughs> great. Well, wow, that's gorgeous. So, Thank you. Most of my stuff I got in Lithuania, but this little one, um, this little one I got oh, pretty. in uh, Colorado. So there, there was a lovely store that imported things from Russia. This was made in Poland. So I don't know why I was in the Russia store, but I really loved it. It's just, you know, it's just so cute. And the, the amber's carved in a heart shape. So that, that's my one piece I got in the, in the U.S. Um, okay, and then one last thing on the amber color is there's green amber too. So this is a necklace I got in, in Lithuania. And a lot of times on the green amber, they paint the back of it black. So this was really interesting because the way they carved the stones, they painted part of them black. And the green amber... It's sort of goldish green and it always has little little pieces of debris in it. I don't know if it's like tree material or something that makes it green like that. But mine has turned more gold since I got it. And I leave it hanging up out on, on my shelf back there where I have things hanging up. And so it's possible that the color changed from being in the light all the time, which is fine. I like it anyway, but it was interesting to notice that. So this is antique amber. Mm. This my great grandmother brought from, I think Ukraine, but maybe Belarus. So same general area, Baltic Sea Amber. This kind of color you can't find in stores today. These colors of beads, they just get that way with time. So they do change over time. And this has been kept mostly in the dark. I keep it in, the, in a drawer in a little uh, satin jewelry bag. And I had, um, I had it made into a long necklace. It was a short necklace and a, like a choker and a bracelet. And I never wore it because I can't stand things touching my neck here. So I had them combined into a a long necklace and re-strung so I was really afraid that at some point it was going to break and I was going to lose the beads because it was just on a thin thread so I had it uh, tied up like pearls but this these old colors and you can find these beads and necklaces online they're not rare but they're they're somewhat expensive compared to um, stuff you can find for tourists because obviously they are vintage or antique and you can't get them. So I had some extra beads left. And so a friend of mine, this is, this is my favorite piece now, a friend um, in Canada oh, yeah. made this for me with some of the extra beads and it's just a little necklace, but I love how it has the leaves and it's just a little bit more contemporary than the string mm -hmm. of the amber beads. So, so there is amber from all over the world. All of my stuff is, is Baltic amber, which comes from that area, mostly from the Baltic Sea. Um, and the amber from different places of the world is different ages. It, it can be millions of years old and some of it that is maybe not technically or scientifically categorized as amber is sold as amber jewelry some some places where it's maybe hundreds of thousands of years old mm. so um it is really interesting that um it would be made from different kinds of trees whatever was in the area at the time um and it would have different inclusions or different pieces of debris or bugs in it um but to my knowledge, none of it has been used to um, create dinosaurs yet. <laughs> I think that, uh, I don't know, maybe it may be possible, but it may be very, very far-fetched, but I like those movies anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and that was some chunk of amber the guy had on his walking stick too, that, that he 
had in that movie. So I don't know if I liked the amber or the dinosaurs best in the Jurassic Park. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so the amber is, you can still pick up sometimes amber on the Baltic Sea, uh, like the picture I had in the back of the booklet. Um, right. People do go out and you can find it, but there's also amber, like kind of amber mining in some places where they found some deposits. Um, there was a really interesting thing that in this place, uh, Yodkrante, um, which is where the Hill of Witches is, and Amber Bay is there too. There was a really famous discovery of all kinds of ancient pieces of amber, amulets, little figurines of people and animals and, and beads. It was, it was really, really a big discovery. And they have replicas of all this stuff in the Amber Museum in Palanga, but the originals were lost in one of the world wars. So I uh, don't know if they were destroyed or like so many other things, somebody stole them and they may come back into visibility at some point in the future because they're in a private collection or something. Um, but the, it's really cool. If you look at the, um, if you search for Amber Museum or Yod Krante, um, it's J-U-O-D-K-R-A-N-T-E, I think. I think that's how they spell the name of town. Uh, Amber Treasures. You can find pictures of all these things and uh, see. And some of them were in the book of the little symbols I put. Like there was a little circle with dots on it, and that was um, a little amber amulet that was from that collection. And the little picture of the kind of looked like a person, like a man, it was about you know this big. And it was in the background on some things. And then at the top of the back page where I had those symbols, that is one of the pieces from that collection too. Um, someday I might buy replicas of those for myself because I think they're really cool. It amazes me to look back and find stuff like so old and thousands and thousands of years ago that people made that just show that like art was really fully formed. Mm -hmm so long ago you find things that are like so beautifully done that we couldn't improve on it no matter how much we tried um, just pretty amazing to me so that's it on amber um i'm going to talk a tiny bit about this area on the coast of lithuania um lithuania was landlocked for a long time and this area that's now called uh, Majoya Lietuva, um, or they call it sometimes Lithuania Minor, but to me the better translation is Little Lithuania, like Little Italy in New York. Um, it was in East Prussia, but it was where all the Lithuanians lived in East Prussia, so hence Little Lithuania. And that's where um, all of the seafaring and, and um, salt water and fishing, fishing industry and everything was in Lithuania. And it's very different in some ways than the rest of the country because there was much more influence of German culture in the um, architecture and the organizations of the towns. So you could like, if you go into the old town of Vilnius, capital of Lithuania, which is inland, the streets are all windy. And, you know, you think of those medieval towns where everything just goes under these archways. And, and then you go to um, Klaibeda, which is a big city on the coast, and all the roads are straight in a grid, and the buildings are really square, and everything's just organized and tidy in that way. So you can see the history in the way the streets are and the way the buildings are. And um, this area used to be a big tourism area for Germany. And a lot of the places used to have German names. For exa example, Kleibeda used to be called Memel. Mm -hmm. And um, 
um, all the other places. They used to have German names. So if you wanted to find it, when you want to start searching for the history of this area, you'll you look for things in Lithuanian as well as things in German. So mm -hmm. um, I have a couple knitting books in German that are focused on this area because it was considered part of German um, sphere of influence, I guess you would say. So this book that I have um, is a, a book all about the knitting in Lithuania Minor. And it's mostly about gloves and mittens because that's mostly what was knit in Lithuania, also socks. Um, but it's got, it's got a lot of information in it and it's in Lithuanian English and English. So I was able to read it even before um, I learned Lithuanian. This is a really interesting, very typical, common pattern only in this part of Lithuania where there's this giant motif of some kind of flower on the back of a hand and then the rest of the hand is patterned um, with really small motif. So most of it's easy to make and then you spend uh, extra time paying attention when you're knitting the that part of it. Um, and then lots of gloves that have um, motifs just on the hands, but plain fingers. And gloves were really important in this part of Lithuania. Here's a couple more. This one here is like freaking amazing. It's like, I tried to count how many stitches are in that motif or something, and it's like 20 stitches an inch to get that mm -hmm. center motif to be so small on a glove. Mm. I, I just, you know, the things people used to do when they, quote, didn't have leisure time, right? <laughs> um, and here's another one of that kind. So this book was really fun to see, as well as some of the German books I had. And it's also got a ton of charts in it, which, of course, we can adapt to use for any projects we want. Um, you can see a lot of those small geometric patterns used on the backgrounds. So in the main part of Lithuania for like ceremonial purposes and for wedding gifts and for um, your dowry chest, you would weave the sashes that we, that I wrote about in the first booklet. Mm -hmm. So you would weave these long sashes and you would give them out to everyone in the wedding party. You would give them to your um, new in-laws when you got married. You would give them to the priest and people that helped in the wedding ceremony. And so you would weave a lot of these and they used them throughout their whole life when you were a baby. And if you were wrapped up in a blanket, it would be tied with one of those. And you would use them for belts and men wore them for bands on their hats, um, garters to hold up socks. And then some were made just for everyday use. So people would weave this really long one like it was like called a hundred pattern um, yosta or sash or tape. And, and they would le we weave this really long one to have when they needed some ribbon for something. And then they would cut it off what they needed and use it. And it could be to decorate something or it could be to tie something closed or just to put a drawstring on a, a bag or whatever. Um, and so in, in, that's in the main part of Lithuania. In Lithuania Minor, Gloves served more of the ceremonial person. So girls would have to knit like a hundred pairs of gloves before they could get married because mm -hmm. they would have to have them for all the guests at the wedding, plus special ones for the priest and the new in-laws and all of that. And, um, and they would sometimes just wear them tucked in their belt, the men as a decoration um, because gloves weren't as warm as mittens. I don't know if you've ever noticed that, but if your fingers are all together in a mitten, they stay warmer than if they're in the individual gloves. So sometimes the gloves were less functional in the really cold winter than mittens. So they were very, very ceremonial. And this was um, really focused in this area of Lithuania in the Lietuva, Majoya Lietuva. So, The borders are over the vast period of time that humans have been on this planet are 
seriously meaningless because like I said, that part of Lithuania was once part of Prussia. Another part was once part of Poland. Once was part of um, Russia. And then at other times in the Middle Ages, Lithuania was the large empire. And so Ukraine and Belarus and Poland were all basically um, the same nation with Lithuania. It was called the Grand Duchy of Lithuania. Uh, but of course, looking back at history, all of those countries I mentioned claim that the Grand Duchy of Lithuania was their national ancestor. So um, really interesting story, but yeah, because the borders move so much, um, they sort of have no meaning as far as looking back at history and customs. Everything just mixed together because people were were going wherever they could at the time that the borders were wherever they got moved to. So, so this was our project. I don't know if you all have started it yet or had any questions on it. Um, I wanted to, the bottom part has what I think looks like mermaid tails in the sea. Mm -hmm. And then the top was just, I didn't want to make it just stockinette stitch. I thought the eyelets could represent the amber beads. Mm -hmm. A couple of people told me they were going to take the necklaces apart and put the beads into their. Oh, that's a nice idea. Into their project, which certainly you could do. It's not, um, um, they have holes in them that are pretty small. So you'd probably have to run a thread along with it to hold the beads. I don't think the yarn would fit through the holes, but I never took one of these apart and tried. Um, but I think the holes are, are pretty small. Um, but certainly you could do that if you wanted to, and that would be a fun idea as well. So this is the, I don't remember, small, small size, I think. I made a small and a medium one. On the large size where people had three skeins, I did this middle part in a different color. It was mostly gold to just give it a little bit more contrast. So have any of you started yet? Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm done. Done, finished? Oh, started, finished? oh wow. <laughs> Yeah, I put, I put amber beads into mine from a trip in Lithuania. I had a little stretch bracelet with amber and I took that apart and was able to use a crochet hook to put it on to. Oh, let's the, see, let's see. Uh, oh, pretty. So I just did it at That's the bottom. That's a shine. Oh, a shine. Wow. Yeah. Whoa. Other oh. side. <laughs> Other side, there we go. Oh, okay, yeah, I can see the beads. Oh. Um, more yeah, clear, so I yeah. just put them at the bottom of the tails. Of yeah, the, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's just for great. Little accent. Yeah. Yeah, yes, it, it, it shines. So it, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. I thought about putting beads on this project too, but we're going to do, a, we're going to have a specifically bead project later in the year. So, oh. um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, but that's a nice, nice uh, touch that you did for it. So, yeah, so this was really fun um, um, to come up with and try to find some colors and stitches that go with the stories. And we talked about this a little bit in our last call. So this time I want to show you what I'm working on next. Okay. So those, those of you who come or watch the video um, get a sneak peek. So <laughs> the next book, since this is The Hill of Witches, and we haven't heard too much about witches yet. The next booklet, sorry, we have a uh, four wheel uh, recreational vehicles that go by my house. Um, <laughs> um, it's too hot to close the windows. Anyway, <laughs> um, since it's the Hill of Witches, this next booklet's going to be about the witches on the Hill of Witches. Now I've had this book for quite a oh, long time. Wow. It's, it's, a, it's a comic, it's a kid's comic mm -hmm. book and it's about Baba Yaga. And that is the witch goddess in the Russian tradition. Okay. And I just love the colors on this. I've wanted to do something mm -hmm. in this. And since we're doing witches and Baba Yaga is the Russian equivalent of the Ragana, witch mm -hmm. of um, Lithuania, I thought we could do those colors for our project. So I have been mm -hmm. experimenting with 
colorways. So here's one of my experiments. Oh, wow. Yes, beautiful. beautiful. Um, here's one. Beautiful. I haven't decided which one yet, so you don't know exactly what you're going to get, but they all have these same colors. In. So this is one of the ones I was trying, and I'm trying different things like sprinkling colors or dipping them in dipping them in pots or all different ways because it's super fun for me to do that part that color play part is like yeah. so oh. fun for me so this <laughs> is one of the ideas and of course yeah it does it looks like that book right yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah. so that's one and uh, this is another one so you can see it's the same kind of ideas but the color the color sections are different and the variety of different it's really interesting that i'm using like five purples and a pink and two greens to, to, <laughs> to do these um so that's really fun and then there's another one that i've already rolled in a ball so you can't really see what it looks like in a skein because right. all the really colors wow. get mixed but i was swatching with it and it it comes out like this Oh, so I'm not sure no. if I want to do, um, I will keep, you know, um, I have to finish the project and start dyeing the yarn next week. So <laughs> I will be deciding very soon, but I'm just, um, thinking about, um, how long are stretches of color I want in this to go with the, the design I'm working on. So it's going to be a witchy kind of a witchy pattern. So. <laughs> All right. Since we're talking about talking about the witches, um, and yeah, so and I also will have uh, in the booklet. It's still a comic, but I also will have a lot of photos of the statues of the witches on Witches Hill, because I think it's really interesting to see. I've drawn some of them. Uh, some of the characters that I've drawn in the booklets already are based on the statues, but it's really fun to see the style of the carving that the artists did over there because wood carving is a huge, huge folk art tradition in Lithuania going back for a really long time. And of course, not much of really old stuff is around because wood rots really easily. Right. So, um, so, you know, there's really not much more than maybe one or 200 years old of made of wood in museums. But that stuff even shows the same kind of symbols and motifs that we have see in weaving and knitting and then in older things like bronze and, and pottery and stuff. So um, these ones at Witch's Hill are much more whimsical and imaginative of the artists wanted to, um, you know, show off the folklore and the stories and, and make something interesting. And what I thought was fascinating is that this was put up during Soviet times because the Soviets mm. were just so weird about everything. It's like at one, and in one way you had to be, I mean, I'm sure I mentioned this last time, but in one way you had to be just a Soviet citizen. You couldn't be a Lithuanian or a, a mm. Jew mm -hmm. or a Ukrainian or whatever, you're a Soviet citizen. And then the other way, they really celebrated all the folk art and folklore of all the people in the Soviet Union. So people got to keep their own stuff going on like that. And um, Witch's Hill was um, very famous in, in um, I guess, Renaissance times and up until like the 1700s. So when Christianity started coming into the area, um, people still practiced pagan traditions and would have big bonfires on midsummer, um, midsummer at midnight and, and different kinds of... Um, uh, offerings that they would make under certain sacred trees. And there's stories about how the, the Christians from across the bay on the mainland would look over to the, to the uh, spit, um, which is just like a really narrow peninsula along the coast. They would look over there and see these fires and everything and be afraid of the witches and the uh, magic that they were doing over there. And there's even a, a big tree near the Hill of Witches and a, a bog, a, a bog that was in the forest that's called the, the um, Linden Tree of Sin. Yeah. And um, mm -hmm. I want to find out more about this because it sounds like really spooky. It's in this bog and there was this giant tree and they would do all these rituals at it. Um, 
And I'm sure it was just regular everyday stuff to the people that lived there, but to the people that had a different uh, worldview, it was really scary. And so they, they, they wrote about it in, in just, you know, those pagans and, and what are they doing? And they must have the devil on their side. And so you're going to hear a bit, a little bit about how all that came into changeover from pagan traditions to Christian and how the ideas about witches and devils and all those kind of things changed over time in Lithuania. Cause it was, um, Like, I don't even, I don't know now because the young people are really very all over the country now have access to everything just like we do. Mm -hmm. You know, all the kids are on the internet. They have TV, they have movies from all over, over the world. Um, so I don't know if it's still, but in the 19th and even in the 20th century, there were still people that would go outside every day in the morning and, um, and pour out an offering of uh, water or beer to the earth and kiss the ground. Um, mm. And, you know, so these, uh, um, these traditions and stories that we have in the folklore, we, we can tell that they're still, that they, we can tell the accuracy of them because people were still doing these traditions. And um, I'm gonna share a little bit with you in the next book like, about uh, spells, spells and um, uh, charms that people said. I found this book, it's like a thousand pages of uh, Lithuanian spells that have actually been recorded around the country by people that went around and, you know, talked to the local, um, mostly women, but some men who were the, the charmers and everything. And they recorded these spells and you can see over time how they changed and it would be, this spell about communing with a tree or a, a reptile or something. And then at the end, they added on and say five Hail Marys. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so you, and you can see the, the, how, how that was. And then there was one that was, um, um, about, uh, bees and honey and you put honey on the wound and you do this and this and you say this you say this nine times under your breath without breathing you have to say it and then you say amen 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 <laughs> and I just thought that was like so great to see um to see like you could see history in that by looking at the different kinds of charms and how they changed in different areas and and everything <laughs> and it's like everybody's always been the same. We're just trying to like stay alive and be healthy and, <laughs> and not get bitten by a snake or that, that a lot of charms are against snake bites. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. So um, I can't believe there was such a book and it was, it's in Lithuanian and English. So part of it's in English, oh. not all of it, but a thousand pages about um, <laughs> Lithuanian spells. So that was like a really really good find for me. <laughs> I yeah. uh, You wouldn't even think to look for it. I don't even know what I was looking for that, that I found that because I wouldn't even think to look for such a thing. You know, I'm usually searching for, you know, symbols on textiles or, um, you know, folk tales with weaving or knitting or spinning in them and things like that. But uh, so it must have had some connection to something I was searching for and I, I, I went for it. So anyway, do you guys have any questions about knitting, about the Baltic Sea, about amber, anything that you would like to talk about? I just appreciate you giving us all this history. That makes this much so yeah. much more meaningful. Mm -hmm. I mean, I love the booklets that you make up. I even when I sent a text message, an email to Dom, I said, I just, it's just so interesting to sit and read all of this. You know, it's, uh, it makes mm -hmm. it so much better. Well, I'm glad you guys love it because um obviously i love it and i love um i love making stuff and sharing it with other people so um i'm very happy to hear that you enjoy that as well and yeah i think it's just fascinating and i think every everybody we all have um that history in our in our background and we might not be able to know about our specific ancestors or grandparents or great grandparents because it didn't get passed down directly but right. um it's all 
together, I think. We're, we're all together. We're all in this together, right? <laughs> That's, right. That's right. I know my husband is, is Jewish and his family, he's managed to track them back down to, um, the hell's the name of the place? Uh, it's part of Poland, but it's, uh, uh -huh. I, know, I can't remember it. Oh, God. But they have Lithuanian in them, and they really, really made an effort to try and find out where his family comes from. Oh, Bohemia. That's uh, oh. another one. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Now he tells everybody he's Bohemian. So uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he still has long hair down to here and a ponytail, so he looks like a Bohemian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's funny. That's funny. No, the, the Lithuanian background, um, um, as far as, uh, yeah, uh, well, Lithuania was called the Jerusalem of the North. I mean, it was the main center for Judaism yeah. from, <laughs> I guess, Renaissance times up till World War II. Yeah. So um, there's a, a lot. Most of the people, uh, most of the Jews in the Russian Empire lived in um, the area that used to be the Grand Duchy of Lithuania. It was called the Palace Settlement. Uh -huh. I might have mentioned that before, but yeah. um, so that's why where you get a, a, like so many Eastern European Jews. It's because yeah. that's the only places they were allowed to live at certain right. times. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. and the cultures were mixed together, mm -hmm. but separate also. I mean, anytime you have people living in the same area, they're going to know each other, right? They're going to do mm -hmm. some things together. They may not be like the closest friends or have the St. Holidays together and things like that. But um, there's always the cross pollination of ideas and foods and, um, and fashion and everything. And so, um, you know, there's nothing that really, I mean, there's nothing that's purely Lithuanian or purely Ukrainian or purely um, anything um, anymore. And there hasn't been probably for a long time. And I'm guessing like, I don't know, maybe thousands of years ago when pe people, you know, se had separated out into different areas and then stayed there for a long time and there wasn't much communication, then things like really developed in different ways. And so you see, I mean, like ancient Egyptian art is very unique. Yes. Um, ancient Chinese art is, is very unique. Um, uh, lots of st stuff, um, pre-Columbian stuff in the uh, in South America, the Mayan and Inca art, um, you know, very unique. But um, once people found each other, they just share and copy and stuff and sometimes in good ways, sometimes in bad ways. But um, that's what happened. So I think like the Lithuanian stuff, because Lithuania has been in the middle of the East and the West, you know, and so it's got, it's had influences from so many places in its folk art. And what, what is unique about it is the way it's all combined together. The colors put together with the patterns and, um, and the type of products that are made out of mm -hmm. these designs. So, yeah, they're beautiful. Yeah. Very beautiful. <laughs> Well, and that's all I have. If you guys have any other questions or any comments, um, we can. Do you happen to have a sample of the Icelandic sweater handy? Oh no. Okay. <laughs> no, I didn't. I didn't. Uh, I haven't made one with this yarn yet. Okay. Um, I have a bunch of the yarn dyed. I'm dyeing it to order. So each oh. after we get each order, I dye the yarn for that sweater all together. Um, no, because Dom sent me an email. I guess that mine's coming. I guess next week. Yeah, so and the excited. um, it it, ha it has nothing to do with Lithuania, but I got inspired. We call it the chicken sweater here because I got yeah. inspired by chickens for the colors, and um, so uh, there is a there is a specific pattern. You'll get a line by line pattern, but we're going to go over options like if you want to add patterning to the sleeves or just the yoke or some people's um don't like the Icelandic sweaters because on them the the pattern starts right at the middle of their bust so we're going to talk right. about how to start the pattern in a different place if you don't want that to happen and all of that um, right yeah but that should be fun um, yes. and I'm trying to decide oh, since I get so hot now I hardly wear my <laughs> sweaters but I, I really like I really want a chicken sweater 
<laughs> and so I'm going to make a little chart. So there's going to be a lot, like a lot of charts to choose from, okay. like Icelandic designs, but I'm making a chicken foot chart and like a little feather chart. So mine is going to be really a chicken sweater. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, I so. finally finished school, so now I actually have time to do stuff. So oh, nice, nice. Awesome. Yeah, so that's that's the um, that's a separate thing, obviously, from the Lithuanian club. Yep. But it's a, a knit along I have going on. Uh, it's going to be it's going to start in August and go end of August to beginning of October. So okay. if you're interested in that, anyone listening to this, you can let me know or look on my website. Okay. Um, yes, but the Lithuanian club's continuing on for several more packages and we've got I just ordered a whole bunch of goodies from Lithuania from several different places and I love getting mail even though it all goes to you guys I love seeing all the things that uh <laughs> that that we get so okay well enjoy the rest of your weekend whether you're going to go outside yep. or stay in the air conditioner yeah. and, um, <laughs> I will look forward to getting these next packages ready to send out to you and talk to you live in a couple months.